Hello and welcome to a tactical history of Liverpool. After their victory against Chelsea in episode 6, Liverpool continued to strengthen their position at the top of the Football League. Their nine-match unbeaten run came to an end against Leeds United on the 27th of December, but they avenged their defeat the very next day with a goal from Gordon Milne, following it up with a win over reigning champions Manchester United on New Year's Day. Today's match comes a week later, with Liverpool making the trip down to London to face Arsenal. Liverpool had good reason to feel positive going into the game. They were of course top of the league, but were also undefeated against Arsenal since getting promoted, and had beaten them 4-2 at Anfield just a few weeks earlier. Despite sitting in the bottom half, Arsenal had their own reasons to be hopeful though. They had lost only one match at home all season, to Chelsea way back at the start of September, and although they were yet to beat Liverpool since the Reds had been promoted, Liverpool were yet to beat them at Highbury in the league either, drawing three times. Bill Shankly made only one change to the starting eleven we saw against Chelsea, with Gordon Milne back from injury to replace Jeff Strong, who had been signed from Arsenal the previous season. At this point in the season, Liverpool had used only 12 players of their squad, today's 11 plus Strong. Liverpool had made only three personnel changes from the team we saw in episode 1, yet Shankly had made far greater systemic changes than Billy Wright had. While both teams had lined up in matching 3-2-5s in August 1964, over the previous season, Shankly had switched to a back four, bringing through Tommy Smith to partner Ron Yates at centre-back, while Chris Lawler emerged at right-back, seeing Jerry Byrne switch over to the left as Ronnie Moran, now helping to bring through younger players in the reserves, was faced out. The only other change was Ian St. John, who surely would have played in that previous game were he not recovering from an emergency appendix operation. For Arsenal, only Jim Fernell, Don Howe, George Eastham and Joe Baker remained of a side that had lost to Liverpool the previous year yet they were still lining up in that same 3-2-5 shape, showing how little had fundamentally changed for Arsenal despite the new faces. Just as they had 16 months prior, Arsenal started the game pumping the ball long whenever they got it. It hadn't worked back in 1964, and it worked even less in 1966. Joe Baker wasn't tasked with leading the line for Arsenal this time, which allowed him to play to his strengths, dropping off into midfield to receive the ball to feet. This is Baker. See how deep he's playing. However, this instead left John Samuels up front, given Samuels was a midfielder rather than a natural forward. This wasn't exactly an improvement, and Liverpool set up ensured he rarely got much in the way of the supply. With the extra man of Smith at the back, Liverpool had even more cover than they had previously, while the way the back four operated only strengthened them further. Knowing Arsenal were just going to pump it in behind them, Liverpool's back line would drop off, ensuring they got to the ball first. As a result, Arsenal didn't threaten at all, and Liverpool soon took control. Whereas Arsenal couldn't wait to get rid of the ball as soon as possible, Liverpool looked to hold on to it with their usual pass and move style. And he finds Stevenson. Here comes Byrne up on the left. Mill now slotted back. Here's Mill. See, Liverpool uh, playing the ball round in circles. This is the new modern idea, or well, modern for this country. It's been used by some countries for quite a time. How long is it since an Arsenal man touched the ball? It must be well over a minute. Several times in the first half, they displayed why teams were moving away from a back three towards a back four. With the Arsenal back line stretched wide, there were big gaps between centre-back Terry Neal and his full-backs. Liverpool players would then attack these gaps, whether it be through a pass. The interception, the anticipation of all the players, so good. And now, this is St John. Or simply dribbling through them. The signal for a Liverpool goal. And it could well be now as it's Callaghan. As we discussed in episode one, teams using a back three would usually protect these spaces to either side of the centre-back by having the half-backs drop back into defence to plug the gap. Tasked with marking St. John, David Court in particular would drop in next to Neil. Like we also discussed in episode one though, having the half-backs drop deep would open up space in the midfield for the opposition to exploit. Here, for example, the run of Milne drags Frank McClintock back into defence opening up space inside for St. John to receive a ball and pick out a cross. It wasn't unusual for Roger Hunt to put a defender out of position by pulling wide or dropping deep, opening up space for a teammate to exploit. Arsenal at least managed to stop Liverpool from cutting straight through them by having their attacking line drop back into midfield to defend, ensuring the half-backs dropping back into defence didn't create as massive a hole between the defence and attack as in episode 1. The sole thing stopping Arsenal from going behind though was Jim Fennell in goal. The goalkeeper had played for Liverpool during their promotion campaign, but an injury early in the season upon their return to the top flight saw him lose his place to Tommy Lawrence, and he never won it back, 
instead leaving for Arsenal. Finell had also played well against his former club in episode one, but here he was truly superb, making saves or claiming the loose ball the many times Liverpool called him into action. Set up, set up. Arsenal posed a bit more of a threat after their poor start, but even that was only really because Liverpool were opening themselves up. As they gained control over the game, Liverpool began to push Byrne and Lawler forward into attack, while Smith would sometimes move into midfield too. Liverpool moving their defenders forward left space for Arsenal to counter into, yet they largely wasted it. Arsenal would begin to break forward at speed, but then just failed to move the ball fast enough, slowing themselves down and allowing Liverpool to get back into position. Arsenal improved a little in the second half, but not enough. They were more willing to pass the ball rather than immediately going long. But the majority of their attacks still ended with them pumping it forward. It was more a matter of them delaying handing the ball back to Liverpool, rather than actually changing how they were playing. Nevertheless, thanks to Fernell, it looked like Arsenal were going to come away with a point despite Liverpool completely outplaying them. That was until Liverpool won a corner with three minutes left to play. The ball was played short to Smith at the corner of the box, altering the angle of attack and causing Arsenal's defenders to step up away from the goal line. Smith crossed towards the back post, where Yates made a run, untracked by Arsenal's defenders, to meet the ball and head home. For once, Fennell wasn't able to get it first, with Yates diving to get the final touch on the ball. Fennell was still the closest Arsenal man to it though, and his knee collided with Yates, causing him to believe he had broken his neck, although it turned out to just be a muscle injury. When I looked up and found so many back of the centre circle, that was the first time I realised I had scored, said Yates. I felt a lot better after that. It wasn't the ending that Fennell's performance deserved, but it was the ending that Arsenal's did. They played the exact same way that had failed them the season before, and worse still, there was none of the second half changes to improve their situation that had appeared in that prior game. Not only were Arsenal not learning from their failures, they were forgetting lessons they had already been taught. Baker preferred to receive the ball to feet. Samuels was a natural midfielder. Easton was an inside forward rather than a real left winger and would continually come inside. Everything about their attacking personnel suggested they should have been playing more passing football, yet instead Arsenal kept pumping it over their heads. The Gunners would go on to win just four more matches all season, and Wright would be dismissed in the summer. Captain for Stan Collis's Wolverhampton Wanderers in England, Wright was a legendary player, but that didn't make him a good manager. Arsenal had finished seventh in his first season in charge, qualifying for Europe for the first time in their history. However, it was all downhill from there. They finished eighth for next season, then 13th, then finally 14th this year. Excluding caretakers, Wright has the worst win percentage of any post-war Arsenal manager. Liverpool, on the other hand, were flying under Shankly. With yet another two points, they continued to strengthen their position at the head of the table, aiming to match Arsenal's record seven league titles. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to support the channel. You can get updates on what I'm doing by following on Twitter and Facebook, links are in the description, but most importantly by supporting Holding Me Field on Patreon. Without financial support, I can't justify the time it goes into making these videos to keep the channel alive while also receiving access to premium content. Thanks for watching.